So last week, we spent most of our time together talking about our church's purpose and what our overarching vision is for our community of believers. We talked about the importance of having a vision. Do you all remember the line? Did you mouth this water a little bit again? I shared what I believe to be our vision, to be a place of refuge for all of God's children, where lives are transformed, a place where we can belong, learn, and grow in our faith tradition, a refuge for all people in all walks and stages of life. We are a place of refuge. This is why God put us here in Boulder City, and it is that vision of transformation that excites us and keeps us going, gets us up out of bed, ready to go. Well, this morning, we're going to look at whose job it is to fund this vision. Where do we get the resources that we need to put God's vision into practice? Well, let's begin with the prayer. Oh, gracious God, I ask that you would open the hearts and minds of all of us here this morning. Lord God, I pray that my words are your words. My thoughts are yours. Lord God, bring forth this message to your people this morning. Amen. Amen. John Wesley is the founder of Methodism and is the son, or was the son, of an Anglican priest in one of England's lowest paid parishes. To say that his family was, was poor would be an understatement. In fact, when John was young, he witnessed his father being taken away to debtor's prison. Now there's something that makes sense, right? And when John felt the call to ministry, he decided that he did not want to follow in his father's footsteps, living in poverty with a large family with little means to care for them. So John turned to academia, taking a teaching job at Oxford University rather than being a poor parish priest. And he did very well at Oxford. He had arrived, in fact. He was very successful by the world's standards. But one day something happened that changed that. One cold winter day, after he had purchased some new pictures to hang on his wall in his room, a chambermaid came to his door. And as I mentioned, it was a cold winter day, bitterly cold, and she stood there, ready to serve, in nothing but a thin linen gown. John reached into his pocket to see if he had enough to, to help her buy a proper coat, and he realized he didn't have enough because he had spent it to adorn his walls while this young woman was freezing outside in the elements. Immediately the, the thought struck him that perhaps God was not very pleased with him. And he asked himself, what, what would my master say? Will he say, well done? good and faithful servant? Hardly. He had adorned his wall with money that he might have shared with this woman, and in that instant, John Wesley was transformed. And as a result, he cut back on his own spending, and at the end of his first year at Oxford, he had earned an astounding 30 pounds. Now, he had only needed 28 to live on, so he donated the extra two pounds to charity. And then the next year, his income doubled, and he made 60 pounds, but he still only needed 28 to live on. And so he then donated 28 pounds. And it happened again the next year. 90 pounds he had earned, 62 pounds he gave to charity. He continued to maintain his modest lifestyle and donated the majority of what he earned throughout his life to the needy. Wesley felt that Christians should not merely tithe, but give away all extra income once the family and creditors were taken care of. He believed that with an increasing income, as Christians, our standard of living shouldn't increase, but what should increase is our standard of giving. 
Wesley understood that giving sacrificially meant that it was done not as a, as a transaction, as a box to check something that was based on duty. He knew that giving sacrificially was done because that is what God asks of us. And it's done in an effort to transform lives. And John Wesley transformed lives through his lifetime of giving. And it said that when he died in 1791 in his will, it, it noted that uh, the only wealth that remained were the miscellaneous coins in his pockets and in his dresser drawer. You see, brothers and sisters, money is a tool. It is only a tool. It isn't good or bad, it just is. It's a tool given to us by God to advance his kingdom. Scripture says in 1 Timothy 6.10, For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil, and in their eagerness to be rich, some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pains. We, as Christians, we can't love both God and money. Our scripture this morning tells us that we can't serve two masters, so we must choose who our master will be. Will it be God or money? And God calls us to demonstrate our faithfulness by managing our resources well. When we are faithful, and faithful with little, the lesson says, we will be entrusted with more. We must demonstrate our own faithfulness by giving all we can. In Matthew 6, 19-21, Jesus tells his disciples that they are not to store up treasures for themselves on earth where moth and rust consume and where thieves break in and steal. But Jesus says, store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust consume and where thieves cannot break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Where is your treasure? I challenge you, when you get home this afternoon, take out your checkbook register or go online to your online banking and review your spending habits. What is the majority of your money spent on? Well, most of us, housing, food, transportation, Clothing, those are generally the largest demands of our resources. But after the necessities are taken care of, where is the rest of our money going? Railroad Pass Casino? Galleria at Sunset? Boulder Creek Golf Club? Amazon.com? Where is your charitable giving in your budget? Is it at the top? Or is it somewhere down at the bottom? How we spend money and resources tells a lot about ourselves. All of our resources are gifts to us from God. We are stewards of all that we have. And we are responsible to use our resources to God's honor and glory. What does that mean? All of our resources are God's. Well, it means that everything we have belongs to God, is a gift from God, and we must confer with God before we spend these precious resources that have been entrusted to us. We must be sure that we are living a balanced life, not spending too much on selfish ambition, but giving to God to support His ministries. Now, you might find it surprising that Jesus spoke about money. He talked about it a lot. Now maybe he didn't like doing it. I, I think they say most pastors don't enjoy it, although I don't really mind it. But Jesus talked about money and material things a lot. 68, 16 of 38, excuse me, parables were about possessions and money and how we are to manage them. In the Bible there's more than 500 verses about prayer. A little less than 500 on faith and more than 2,000 on money and possessions. Jesus knew that we would struggle over money. That's why he spoke about it and taught about it so much. 
I find it, it doesn't matter how much you have, <clears throat> there's still struggle, right? How many millionaires have we seen who have declared bankruptcy? And if you look at lottery winners, you might be surprised that 70% of all lottery winners go broke and declare bankruptcy. 44% had spent all of their winnings within the first five years. And money problems can happen to all of us. Money is something that we think about a lot. How and when might we get it? What do we do when we get it? How much should we share? How much should I keep for myself? Well, what would I do if I suddenly came into a large amount of money? How many of you have sat thinking about, oh, if I win the lottery, gosh, I'll buy a house for this person and a new car here, and I'll build a church. <laughs> I'm not suggesting we all go win the lottery. In fact, I don't suggest that. Money consumes our waking hours and interrupts our dreams. And when we're, when we're not thinking about currency and credit card and checking accounts and our investments, we wonder about prices on automobiles and clothing and generic medications. We try to keep our taxes down and save on energy in our homes and seek uh, cost-effective ways to travel. In North America, being a consumer is considered a birthright. Money's hold is so powerful that it's estimated one-third of all adults say that final financial worries prevent them from sleeping at night. People of all walks of life have challenges when it comes to money. And like I said before, balance is the key. Most of us will not give like John Wesley gave. And God isn't asking us to do that. God is asking us, though, to allow him to work through all of us to help his kingdom. We are to give generously and sacrificially to our church so that God can transform the world. Now, I don't know how many of you are aware of our church budget. Anyone take a guess what our annual budget is? 150000 just under $150,000 a year. And with that budget, we fund all of our ministry programs, our outreach, our education, worship and fellowship, pastoral care, programs for children, adults, and seniors. Everything we do, including my salary, is from this budget. So where does that money come from? Whose job is it? to fund the church budget. Well, I am very proud to say that since 1999, when this church was founded, our church has been 100% self-funded. And that's unusual for a new Methodist church that's just starting out. Now, we're 16 years down the road, and we are still 100% funded. The group of folks that began this church were incredible servants who took the responsibility to create this church here in Boulder City and they were committed to the financial support. Every dollar that goes into the offering plate is spent on managing the missions that God has called us to create and lead. And all of us here share the responsibility for the day-to-day -day ministries of our local church. God funds the ministries that he desires through our own pocketbooks. But we have to be listening. Listening to the call and giving as much as we are able. Now there are scriptures that will tell us that we should be giving 10%. That's, that's the tithe. Jesus would say 10% is minimum. Now, if every single person in our congregation tithed, if everyone gave their 10%, we would have an excess such that we would have our own worship facility within a year or two at the most. But instead, we struggle each month to meet our ministry obligations, and in recent months, we've had to reach into our savings to make ends meet. So what do we do? We cut back on ministry? Do we say, God, oh, sorry, we, we don't have the money for what you want us to do? 
Are we to stop being the hands and feet of Christ in our community? Or are we to trust and have faith that if God has brought a ministry to us to manage, that he will provide the means to do so? I believe that having enough money is a matter of faith. And when people, when I see people getting excited about new ministries and revved up for a new idea to reach our hurting world, I don't ever worry about how we'll pay for it. I trust that God will provide what we need for the projects that he has given us. And if we get distracted by focusing on what we don't have, that deficit that is before us, we risk becoming an inwardly focused church. And that, my friends, leads us into a very dangerous downward spiral. What we can do is listen to God's calling on each of our lives. What is it that God is calling us to share of our own personal resources so that God can be at work here in Boulder City? and in the world beyond. How many lives will be transformed by the work we are doing because the majority of us will give sacrificially and with that joyful heart? Now we could take the entire budget, 150,000, and divide by our 87 members. That would be 1,725 per person. I'm here $33 a week. Now couples, that's 66. There's two of you. Is that what we're supposed to do? Some churches do that. That's not how we do it. That's not what God asks us to do. He doesn't say, give your fair share. God asks us to give sacrificially and an equal portion of our income, that 10% that tithe. Do you remember what Jesus said to the poor widow who gave just a penny? He pointed to the rich people, and although they had put in large sums, they gave out of their abundance out of their excess. And the widow who gave a penny gave out of her poverty because, you see, she gave everything she had. And it is my prayer today that as dedicated disciples of Jesus Christ that we would evaluate, each one of us, what we are giving to our church. Are we being good stewards of what God has entrusted to us? Are we giving sacrificially, or are we just giving the crumbs that are left over? I invite you to envision a time, envision with me when our budget woes would be turned to celebrations, when we are able to expand our influence and further reach into our community with God's love, when we will have worship space that we can call our own. It is up to all of us to hear and follow the call of God and to be his faithful servants. After all, sisters and brothers, that is our job. Let us pray. Lord God, let us be joyful givers, knowing that through our sacrifice, lives 